Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to worship you, we surrender our lives into your hands so that we may be led by you day by day until we see you again in the heavenly kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A little bit of uh, Adventist history. This song we're going to sing this morning is written in lyrics by Pastor HMS Richards of the Voice of Prophecy. And the music was put in by Wayne Hooper. Now, as we sing this song, I'm sure HMS Richards would think about Genesis 1, verse 1 to 3, about how the world was created. And as we sing this song, we hope you would follow up the lyrics that we sing and in your mind appreciate God's creation. Shine on me, let the heaven light shine on me. For lo is the way to the upper bright world, let the heaven light shine on me. Oh, brother, you must bow so low. shine on me let the heaven light shine on me let the heaven light shine on me for low is the way to the upper bright world let the heaven light shine on me Bright world, 
Let the heaven light shine on me. Oh, preacher, you must bow so low. Preacher, you must bow so low. For low is the way to the upper bright world. Let the heaven light shine on me. Let the heaven light shine on me. Shine on me. Let the heaven light shine on me. For the scripture reading, let us read from Nehemiah 5, verse 1. And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. May our Lord give us understanding on the reading of this verse. Thank you. A very good morning and a happy Sabbath once again. We continue in our series of uh, the different lessons from leadership in the book of Nehemiah. And uh, today, I entitled this sermon here, Our Cry. Maybe a question, have you perhaps had a cry, perhaps to the Lord? He asked God to answer your prayer or you have certain things you struggle through. But you felt that God didn't hear your cry. Or perhaps you may have your cry that you may have given to your family, your boss, or even in church. And you felt, where is the people who hear my cry and my concerns? I think today we would like to hear uh, also how many of you feel that way. We have a short survey later. But before that, I saw this uh, story this week. I don't know how many have seen this one about uh, any show of hands, about a Chinese Tai Tai who finds a personal nanny willing to kneel while putting her shoes on her. Anyone? They've probably been a few. Okay. Yes. I thought the interesting question is, how many of us would be willing to consider that? Uh, well, some of the interesting uh, things that the person is asked to do, the hours, not, um, not too crazy yet, 9 to 9, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. It includes putting on the shoes for the employee, employer, as well as uh, helping to take off the person's coat. So apparently when the person, when the lady there, when she shrugged her shoulders, then the person is supposed to automatically remove her coat. And then they're supposed to be waiting at the door, I think five or 10 minutes before this person comes back, ready to remove the person's shoes and socks. And it did, of course, spark uh, some debate online uh, as well. She said that those with the, this is a job advertisement uh, to, to say that was seen last week. He said, those with high self-esteem not needed. And she said, one should desire to be as a personal mate as in the ancient times. It's like, wow. It's like, I thought I haven't seen all these things for a long time, but suddenly some of these interesting things came back. So when she extended her feet, put her shoes. When she shrugged her shoulders, put her coat. Wow, that is uh, all the different kind of things uh, that's happening. And... Uh, 
there, there is an interesting thing, and also she will have to work at night to wash and massage the women's feet, as well as prepare water and fruit on command. Now, all this may sound not so nice, but what if I told you this was a very well-paying job? Many than, many, much higher than much many of us earn. This job pays 27,000 Singapore dollars a month. Wow, right? Will you be considered to do such a thing? And I think uh, that's what I'd like to know from us today. Uh, we may scan the QR Menti code. Uh, is here, and uh, the code at menti.com, if you don't like to scan code, menti.com is 37466638. Yeah? So in the past, people may say, I, uh, slavery, uh, made, uh, bully them, uh, that's because they don't get anything, right? Zero dollars. What if they get some money, uh, $27,000 a month? You, you think, okay, I don't mind to do it, or you think, no, I uh, still cannot. So I thought I would like to ask you for different areas in for yourself, is this kind of work that you will accept for you? If not for you, then how about for others? You think, okay, maybe not for me, but other people, those who want, okay? Or you think, no, 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 this kind of work, no one should have to do such a thing, you know? Whether it's how much money. So I, you can, I invite you to scan the QR code, and uh, from there, we hope to be able to see. Let me see if it's working. I hope, uh, I hope this slide is working, and let me take a look. Okay, it's moving along. So, okay, so we invite you to continue to answer. And for five, we strongly agree uh, this type of work, okay, is good for you. For, for uh, one, we strongly disagree. I cannot, I will not accept such a form of work. Okay, so I have the answers here with me so far. And uh, as we can see so far, uh, it's still adjusting. But so far, around three out of five, so this from rate from one to five, from those who say, okay, currently it's around 3.2, say, okay, I don't mind to consider. So it's above 2.5, so I will consider as can, they don't mind. Um, enough people don't mind to consider. Uh, for others, you think, uh, I cannot put people through such a thing. Slightly lower at 2.3, uh, 2.2 now dropping. At the amount where people think this is good for others, so you won't say, I won't be the one to push it on others, but if I don't mind to take it myself. And others, uh, 2.1 of the amount people said that is for no one. So some people feel, no, 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 it doesn't matter the amount of money you get. Or maybe if the money is more, it changes, but let's assume. Doesn't matter the amount of money, but no one should have to do such a work. And I think it's kind of interesting to look at it, uh, considering the fact that in the past, right, without having such amounts of money, slaves had to do such things and much more. Right? They would basically be the tool of the owner. Right? They had no rights. Death could happen at any time. But... Such was life back then. And I thought, in uh, essence, also the next slide, uh, since the sermon is entitled, Hear My Cry or Hear Our Cry, I'd like to understand from us, to also answer, do you feel your cry is heard? Perhaps whether it's at church, your concerns, the things you voice out, do you feel that you are heard? And perhaps at work, do you feel your cry is heard? Or you feel, ah, no one ever hear me. I, no matter how I say, no use or so. And at home, perhaps, do we feel that our cry is heard? The concerns we bring up, the things we say, or you feel, I am unheard. So, I move that slide away. I need to move the slide along. So please uh, invite you again. If the same QR, actually, you can just press next and answer. If you have not, you can always scan. Do you feel that your cry is heard? Whether at home, at church or at work, whichever the answer is. Yeah. Okay, as you fill up, let me see if I can get it on screen or not. Yeah. I think maybe next time. Okay, some of the answers are in. And so far, as we look at our cry, whether it's heard, 
generally uh, for strongly agree, which is five, and once again strongly disagree is one. At church, the answer is an average of 3.3. So we feel that we are heard, maybe 60 plus percent, okay, somewhere there, better than less than 50, but not quite there yet, still can be better. At work, oh, I think no chance, uh, less than 50%. At 2.2, people feel that we are mostly, our cries are not heard. And at home, thankfully, uh, better than in church even, at 3.2. Seven, uh, people feel that you are hurt. So that's good. It's a good starting point where we can consider that our cries are hurt, at least at home and more. At church, still pass, and uh, at work, not so good. So I thought these are interesting points that we are to consider uh, as we tackle this today. The question, as we jump to the scripture that was read just now, by other hardy or no, and there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against the Jewish brethren. We will take a look soon at what that outcry was. But we have to look at the word of outcry. Uh, I don't remember how to pronounce now, even though I heard this morning. Sa'aka, I believe. And the outcry, the idea of there is an outcry from the people, particularly a cry of distress, especially heard by God. So this is a cry, of course, uh, by the people, normally the people of Israel in the Bible. But what, a cry that is different from one which is normally God hears and God hears their cry. If I may invite us to venture to shout out an answer, where is the famous outcry in the Bible that the people cried out to the Lord? Yeah. Do you have any things in the mind that comes to mind? A place that the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for the help. Sorry? Peter, okay. Any others? The children of Israel were struggling they were having a hard time and they cried out to the Lord, Lord, help us, this is too much for us to bear. That would be the children of Israel when they were slaves in Egypt, right? You all remember uh, we were talking about that idea of slavery earlier. When they were slaves in Egypt for 400 over years, imagine the burdens they had to bear, making their bricks day and night, not having their uh, rights, have even having their babies killed. It was just worse and worse, and they cried out to the Lord to deliver them. We see there uh, that they indeed cried out, and God heard their cry. That's very important to know, right? When the people cried out to the Lord, God heard their cry. And He heard them, and He remembered His covenant to remember them and to acknowledge them. And He has a response for them. And His response for them was to call Moses. Uh, Moses was at the burning bush and God told Moses that he has heard his people's cry. And because he has heard their cry, he has asked Moses to come to restore them out of the land of Egypt where they were slaves, to save them. So God hears their cry in the Bible. And I believe God also hears our cry today when we cry out to him. Here, if we come to the story of Nehemiah, uh, in Nehemiah 5, there was a great outcry on what purpose that were they crying out for. Uh, we learn from the uh, others who have preached so far that they were rebuilding the walls and the, of the temple Jerusalem. And there, as they were rebuilding, there were external problems, which we have heard from others, they had to defend against soldiers, against uh, people who attacked them to prevent them from building. But there were also some internal problems because the poor were mistreated by the rich. Well, there was a famine there and there was no grain. The people, the poor people, had to mortgage their lands, their vineyards, their houses. So they lost all their different properties and things that were there to generate income for them because in order that they might buy grain and to survive. Moreover, because that they were now a tributary under the Persia, they had to pay tax. And they didn't have money because they already had mortgaged their land, vineyards and fields. So they borrowed money from the richer people. But the richer people in Israel even charged them exorbitant interest and so that it forced them to continue to be stuck there. And eventually, they even had to sell their children, their sons and daughters as slaves to the richer Israelites. And because 
they did not have any lands, vineyards, and houses. They could never make back the money. They were working forever. The interest was too high. They could never repay. They were stuck in a position they, they could not redeem their children. They were stuck in a perpetual cycle of slavery. And that was not meant to be the case because in the time of Moses, Moses himself, when God had given them different rules, there were times that they were supposed to return the lands to them, the vineyards, the lands and houses. But they did not practice that. That's why they got stuck. There was times that they should not, the, the Bible there during that time told them they were not to charge interest when they were to lend money to one another. But however, the people in Nehemiah's time did not practice that as well. And so because of their unfair practices, this led to the outcry of the people because their sons, their daughters were stuck being slaves and they could not get out of that cycle. And so when Nehemiah heard this, he was naturally concerned. He, was, he became angry when he heard the outcry of the words. So you notice first, when there is an external threat of an outcry, God raises a leader, right, Moses, to deal with the outcry and deliver his people and redeem them. When there is an internal threat, uh, in this case, he doesn't kill them, just like the Israel, uh, Egyptians, but he does also raise a leader to deal with the outcry. And he raised Nehemiah, who was there to listen to the outcry and take a response. And so Nehemiah spoke to them, probably first privately, but likely they didn't listen. And so he brought it publicly as an assembly before all of them to call them together. And he spoke to them and he said that he has seen, he has seen their oppression. He has seen of how the things that they were doing. And he said these things were no good. What they were doing was not just to what the people had done. They were rebuilding the temple, but they had neglected their poor brethren who were suffering, who were slaves, and they just went on. And Nehemiah said, this is not right. After that, he rebuked them in front of all the people. And I thought it's very interesting to see that Nehemiah had the courage to do so and the guts. Because you must remember that rebuilding the temple requires money. And of course, it would be, have been all the rich people there who have funded the, the rebuilding of the temple. He could have lost all the funding. He could have said the thing may not have been able to continue. And perhaps he may have lost the support, right? Because they had control of many different things. But he determined to do what was right. Whether it was popular with the people or not, he chose to still rebuild them in front of all the people because he chose to do what God had called him to do, which was to restore things to the people. And so that idea of redeeming, he called them to mind because they had been redeemed, even the richer ones. First, the children of Israel had been redeemed because they had been redeemed as slaves in the time of Egypt. So they had remembered their forefathers had done, done so. But recently even, they had been redeemed because they were in exile as slaves in a foreign land in Babylon, in Persia. And they all had been redeemed not too long ago as well. And Nehemiah was calling that to their attention of how God had redeemed them. And because of God who had redeemed them, surely, he says, we should also likewise do the same for our brethren, our brothers there. And so as he spoke, they didn't have anything to say. They could have counted for whatever good reasons they had, but they were silenced and they realized what they did was not good. So they didn't say anything and, this, and, and he might say, what you're doing is not good. Shouldn't we walk in the fear of God so that we will not be the reproach of our na other nations and enemies? So he said, please stop all these things. Stop doing all these things. Restore to them their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, and also all that they have they have given 100 of their money, grain, new wine, and oil that he has been charged. So there, the people who have suffered as slaves, in front of all the people, Nehemiah got them to say, and they said, we will restore it, and we will require nothing from them and do as you say. So Nehemiah took the opportunity, asked them to swear before all the priests, require them that they would do so. And then, they have their ways of doing things. We know in time of roof, they exchange sandal. In this case, they took a garment and then he 
shook it and say, may God shake out those who don't reperform this promise. And so everyone said, Amen, and they praised the Lord and they did according to that promise. When we look at the idea of our cry, we ask ourselves, is our cry heard? Do we sometimes also practice, possibly practice things against others that may not be what the Lord wants? Sometimes we may look at things, what is legal, but what is legal may not always be what is moral, right? It may be not wrong in terms of legality, but it may not be what is kind. It may not be what is God has called us to do, right? So we may say we may not be doing anything wrong, but then still we may be subtly oppressing others. We may say, ah, oh, we are giving their just deserts, but God has called us a step further to redeem, to be kind to others. And here in uh, Prophets and Kings, page 651, it says, even among those who profess to be walking in the fear of the Lord, there are some who are acting over again the cause pursued by the nobles of Israel. Extravagance, overreaching, extortion are corrupting the faith of many and destroying their spirituality. It is possible sometimes that we may choose to overreach, choose to, by either consciously or maybe not so consciously, choose extravagance at the expense of others. I think God is asking us to consider, right, of how these things may affect our brothers and sisters in Christ. Perhaps we may not see it so openly, but things to think about. He says, every unjust act toward a fellow human being is a violation of the golden rule. Wow. When I read this, it kind of hit me, thinking, you know, the golden rule, right, do to others what you have them do to you. Sometimes the things that we do may be a bit unjustly towards others. We may not have thought about it. Sometimes it may need to be pointed out. Sometimes when we pray, the Holy Spirit may reflect on us. It says, every wrong done to the children of God is done to Christ himself in the person of the saints. Every attempt to take advantage of the ignorant weakness or misfortune of another is registered as fraud in the ledger of heaven. God is reminding us here in Prophets and Kings that any attempt to take advantage of others is fraught in the ledger of heaven. Any unjust act towards other fellow human beings and fellow brothers and sisters is a violation of the golden rule God has called us. And I thought as I reflected on this as well, there are definitely things sometimes that I also might do that may be unjust towards others. There are things that we may have to reflect and, feel and confess our sins and think that we need to change our attitudes towards others. Perhaps it may be in our attitudes towards how we may treat other people. Perhaps it may be trying to just put people at arm's length. Perhaps it may be the idea that we may treat people partially, differently, based on who they are. There may be different attempts, perhaps, to take advantage of others, whether more knowingly or unknowingly. But if we are going through this struggle, if we have a cry to the Lord. Take heart. The Bible has shown that God hears our cry. He heard the people's cry when they were slaves in Egypt. He redeemed them. He restored them. He heard the people's cry when they were in exile. He restored and redeemed them. And he heard the people's cries when they were mistreated by their own Jewish brethren in the time of Nehemiah. And he raised up a leader to restore them. Today, likewise, if we have our cries, sometimes if we bring it to the workplace, sometimes to the church, we may not hear our cries being answered. But one thing is sure, we may pray, and perhaps I believe God will move the hearts of those so that our cries may be heard. If there are cries that you, of course, I may not have heard you as well, I invite you to share, whether anonymously if you don't like to, or openly, to myself or any of the church leadership. Sometimes we may not have heard your cries too. We invite you to share and we want to hear what you have to say. Perhaps we may not do everything you say, but we want to hear and we can have a discussion on where we can move forward together. The lesson of leadership here in Nehemiah reminds us that we are not to treat others unjustly. We are called to treat others fairly. We are called not to take advantage of others. And for me today, I'd like to extend to all of us, if you have a cry, share it with us, share with me or any of the church leaders. We are one to hear your cries, your concerns, and we hope that we can address them by God's grace.
Now we just come to the part, uh, as the end of the sermon, to the 160 years of uh, celebration. And the 160 years, as I mentioned earlier, in May 20, 1963, has the idea of that how did our church form? And also, as we may have the cries of the church, we have, of course, the loud cry, right? Which is to call people out of Babylon. We have the three angels, trumpets, and cries that we are called to reach the world. And in response to that, before we come to that, I thought first I'll just do one more quiz for us. I just wonder how many of us know even the founders of our Adventist church? Uh, I thought I'd make it a bit easier. i give some options for us. You can click on multiple answers. So once again, if you don't mind, I uh, invite you to scan the QR, click on the answers, and write, what are the different founders of our Adventist church uh, that we can click on? You can choose multiple. There is more than one founder, I should say first. And uh, let's see, we will have the answers shortly. Okay. I hope it's working. Let me check. Okay, as we continue to fill up, there's one more after that, uh, after this. The Seventh-day Adventist Church at first uh, did not want to form officially. In the 1850s, actually, uh, James White had to write for, I believe, six over, six over years of different uh, editorials in order to convince the people to form a church. Because at the past, in those distant past, people thought that Jesus is coming soon, why need to form? And that was part of the reason. And he had to convince them that they, they were not going against God's will because they felt that an uh, organized church was not something that was God's will. And so over time, they had to talk, discuss, convince, and also Ellen White later supported the position. And there, uh, they eventually formed together because they reached a point where they had over 75,000 people across Europe, Asia, and all parts of the world, and they realized they could not manage it anymore. And that's why eventually the church was formed because they wanted to be faithful to what God had entrusted to them. But we will take a look later. Okay, we have the answers right here. Uh, everyone knows, of course, Ellen White is the founder. So we have out of the answers, 29 people put Ellen White, 24, James White, 26, Joseph Bates, and 14 for John Nevin Andrews or J.N. Andrews. So I think... Uh, most people know uh, the answers and let me, let me double check in case I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, the... SDA Church. Yes, okay, at least from what I have here uh, is correct. So the founders here include, of course, actually the answer is all four of them. Eh? Many of us don't have uh, the J. N. Andrews there. I think he's perhaps a bit less known. He was known as the first mission, official missionary, and they sent him to Europe. I think, so today I think we can learn one thing. For those of us, there's only half of us who put his name, and uh, the rest uh, we know we can learn along the way. The second one is why was the SDA Church founded? Okay, we have different reasons uh, they have. First, for mission. Uh, second, as a, to be a good steward you know, of our resources. Second is for eschatological reasons because you know, uh, the, there is a different, uh, the Daniel Revelation, there's time where God has called us to do so. So we do that. Then of course there's ecological, which is the purpose to form a church. We need to assemble together. So that's why we need to form uh, the church. So... Uh, let's take a look. Uh, there are, all, of course, small reasons, uh, but we look at the main reason, uh, according to at least our Adventist review uh, from what they say. Okay? okay, we have different answers coming in about the founding of the SDA Church. Yeah. 
1863, when they first founded, there was about 3,500 members and six conferences, all the way to 22.2 million members today in 212 countries, about 97,811 churches and 753 conferences and missions. Yeah? So here it says that the past is a place for, of reference, not for residents. Yeah? So it's not, I mean, but yes, we must celebrate our legacy, but stay focused on unity, identity, and mission. Okay, not so many people answer. Uh, 10 people answered mission, four stewardship, three eschatological, and three ecclesiological. Yeah, I think definitely for mission is one of the main reasons. But I thought uh, here they also proposed another reason, which was stewardship. Because they could not manage anymore of just having a few people managed in America, the whole wide world. Right? And then first for the purpose of mission, but first to be good stewards to what God has given them, they thought their resource has to be official so that they can now set up different conferences and manage them. So to be a good steward of God, they realized that God is the God of order in the heavenly sanctuary, as they've seen. And likewise, they thought they have to be good stewards and to, of course, to enhance the mission, they chose to found the SDA Church. Okay. So today we come to the end uh, and the call for us, of course, is to go forth and share because we are indeed chosen for mission. When we hear the cries of others seeking the Lord, we are called to answer their cries. When we hear that indeed the three angels' loud cry has called us to go forth to share of people who is crying to thirst and hunger for the truth, we are called to share so that people may come and know of more of the Lord. And that's why today, uh, as I mentioned in the start of announcement letters, I invite us to just uh, together uh, help me in this matter that the general conference I have asked us to all take a simple video together, uh, just take all together, and uh, let us say different things. We can start with uh, chosen for mission, okay? So I will take a video together and we try to say, uh, hopefully it works and maybe I will do one with Mike and one without just in case it doesn't work. So chosen for mission, yeah? That is, the, that is our team. Okay, uh, let me do that together so we can do it. We do a selfie. So chosen for mission is the team, okay? Let's do that. Ready? Okay, let's try. Oops. Give me a moment. All right, here we go. Ready? Uh, one, two, three. Chosen for mission. One more time. One, two, three. Chosen for mission. Sorry, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. We will send it in. Hopefully, our general conference will use our video. If not, anyway, we know that we are chosen for mission and answer the cries of the world to hear the changes message. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this remembering that you have called us to not take advantage of others, but called us to answer and hear the cries. And if we have our cries in our heart, we pray that you hear our cries too. Father, may we also learn to hear the cries of others as you have heard our cry and redeem us. May we likewise redeem others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father in heaven, we praise you indeed because you hear our cries. So Lord Jesus, as you have redeemed us, we pray that your Holy Spirit will strengthen us as we also restore relationships and restore others. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, may his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.